Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to worship today on this beautiful Sunday morning. Uh, just one quick announcement before we do get started, um, and that is today, if you are willing to stick around for a little while, I'd be willing to share some spaghetti with you because at 11.30 we're going to be doing our annual fall talent show and spaghetti feed over in the Celebration Center. And uh, so you'll get a chance to come on in, sit down, uh, have some spaghetti and watch some of the talented people in this congregation. And uh, that will be a fundraiser for our upcoming ski trip for the high school youth. So if you want to stick around, uh, that would be greatly appreciated. Um, just one more thing before we do get started today. I have a temple talk this morning, and uh, Elmer Merman is here to give that. Come on up, Elmer. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Encourage and recruit. This weekend, our St. Paul's kicking off a project called Encourage and Recruit. In recent years, we have had several call committees who put together a First St. Paul's profile to help attract candidates for vacancies in our ministry. I had the opportunity to serve on the last call committee that hired our current vicar, Ethan Ferry. When the committee was updating the information on the profile, Several members indicated that the information in the profile would be good for all members of the congregation. Today you have that opportunity to pick up a copy of the updated First St. Paul's Lutheran Church profile in the church gathering area. I encourage you to take it home, read it over from cover to cover. I guarantee you, you will find information you didn't know or you have forgotten. After you have read it, maybe there is a program where you may want to get involved. Maybe there is a program you can volunteer. The church is always in need of more participants and volunteers. That is the encouraged part. Now let's go to the recruit part. Don't put the profile on a shelf, in a drawer, or throw it away. Take it with you as you visit with a friend, a family member, or neighbor who hasn't discovered God's love. Invite them to visit our church. Take them if they need transportation. Be excited about First St. Paul's and what we have to offer. Leave the profile with them to remind them of your visit. Imagine. 800 people out recruiting new participants and members for First St. Paul. Don't forget to pray for help and guidance as you carry out your mission. Remember again, encourage and recruit. Thank you. Thank you, Elmer. This morning as we begin our service, I would like to open with this blessing. May the peace of the Lord be with you all. And also with you. Please stand and share God's peace with your neighbors. Everybody, please stand. 
and our worship continues from the front page of the bulletin. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. God of all mercy and consolation, come to the help of your people, turning us from our sin to live for you alone. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit, that we may confess our sin, receive your forgiveness, and grow into the fullness of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us now confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Gracious God, have mercy on us. We confess that we have turned from you and given ourselves into the power of sin. We are truly sorry and humbly repent. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things we have done and things we have failed to do. Turn us again to you and uphold us by your Spirit, so that we may live and serve you in newness of life. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for you. And for your, his sake, God forgives you all your sins. As a called minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I invite you all to continue standing as we sing our opening hymn, number 793.
them for all who offer here their worship and praise. Let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. God's people on yourself and welcome us as beloved children. Help us to lay aside all envy and selfish ambition, that we may walk in your ways of wisdom and understanding as servants of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Please be seated.
gospel reading for this morning can be found on page 821 of the Pew Bibles in front of you. It is from the Holy Gospel according to Mark, the ninth chapter. Lord, you, Lord. Jesus and the disciples went on and passed through Galilee. He did not want anyone to know it, for he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, The Son of Man is to be betrayed into human hands. They will kill him, and three days after being killed, he will rise again. But they did not understand what he was saying, and were even afraid to ask him. Then they came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them, What were you arguing about as we traveled? But they were silent, for on the way they had argued with one another about who was the greatest. So he sat down, called the twelve to him, and said, Whoever wants to be first must be last of all, and servant of all. Then he took a little child and put it among them, and taking it into his arms, he said to them, Whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes not me, but the one who sent me. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise you. If you'd all remain standing, we are going to sing our next hymn, number 685. Savior. And they remind us that these signs fulfill the promises made through the prophets of the Old Testament. They certify that Jesus really is God's Messiah. But there comes a point when there's this change of focus, when Jesus starts to prepare his disciples for the cross. Over the past few Sundays, we've heard that 
Jesus began to seek solitude, that he'd leave the crowds following him and go off to a more private setting so he could teach his disciples. And he still performed miracles, Jesus still proclaimed the gospel, but his main focus was on preparing his disciples for his upcoming suffering and death and resurrection. So that's why our reading today from Mark's Gospel opens with the words, and then they went from there and passed through Galilee, and he didn't want anyone to know it because he was teaching his disciples. So all four Gospel accounts make it clear that Jesus prepared his disciples by regularly teaching them about what was going to happen. This is the change in focus. Jesus was teaching his disciples and saying to them, the Son of Man is going to be betrayed into human hands, and they will kill him, and three days after being killed, he will rise again. And from that point on, this is the focus. Whenever Jesus and his disciples meet in private, this is what he is telling them. Now, although this message seems fairly clear to us, the disciples weren't catching on. Today's reading tells us that they didn't understand what he was saying, and they were even afraid to ask. I mean, you can imagine Jesus getting frustrated by this, but we need to remember that the idea of somebody dying and coming back to life was foreign for the disciples. I mean, they have the accounts of the Old Testament prophets raising other people from the dead, and Jesus himself had miraculously brought people back to life, but nobody had ever come back from the dead under their own power. It was unheard of. So it was totally outside of the disciples' experience. They didn't even have television. I mean, today our popular TV shows, our supernatural shows, our superhero movies, it's not uncommon for a favorite character to die and then come back through some magical loophole. So, it's not as if the disciples didn't want to understand Jesus. No, they just didn't have the right understanding. They lacked the emotional and spiritual tools needed in order to understand just what Jesus was telling them. Mark gives us an example of just how clueless the disciples were. We not only read that they didn't understand, but there's also an incident that followed that showed just how much they didn't understand. And it's this. After Jesus finished teaching them, the disciples started a debate. They started arguing amongst themselves about who was going to be the greatest in God's kingdom. I mean, think about that. Right before his death, Jesus prayed to God that he wouldn't have to go to the cross. And the Bible tells us that while he was praying, he was so distraught that he sweat drops of blood. And nevertheless, when he shared that intense faith with his disciples, their response was to discuss who was the greatest. Jesus was telling them about the single most amazing event in all of history. I mean, salvation, a sacrifice on the cross for the sins of all people. And their first question was, who would be the leader once Jesus was gone? How embarrassing it must have been when Jesus asked them, what were you arguing about as we traveled? But Jesus used that moment of embarrassment as an opportunity to teach them, as an opportunity to teach us what it means to be a leader in his church. He sat them down and said, well, whoever wants to be first must be last of all and servant 
of all. He's basically saying, well, in my family, in God's family, the leader is the one who serves. The one who is highest makes themselves the lowest. The leader in God's family sacrifices not to get power for themselves, but to serve others. Then, to emphasize his point, Jesus called a child over. He brought him into the middle of the group so everyone can see, and then taking the child into his arms, Jesus said, whoever welcomes a child like this in my name welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes not me, but the one who sent me. Jesus connected this child to himself, and then he connected both himself and the child to God. Last night we had a double baptism at our 6 o'clock service, and just that same thing happened. Two children were connected to God by the sacrifice of Christ, by the sacrament of Holy Communion. The Greek word that's translated as child in our gospel indicates a young person somewhere between the age of preschool and second grade. And at that age, most children have a handle on feeding themselves and getting dressed, understanding simple sentences, but we're still talking about an age when children need a lot of help just to survive. This child could do a few things for himself, but for the most part, this child was pretty helpless. <clears throat> Jesus is saying, the greatest serves the most helpless. I mean, that's pretty much the opposite of the way the world thinks. From the time of Adam and Eve and their first sin until now, people have wanted power and control. We think the greatest people in this world are those who can control others and make others serve them. If we look at the other scripture readings for today, we see examples of this. Problems we have in this world because we would rather have others serve us. Throughout the entire Bible, throughout all of our history, we see that human beings have this problem with greed and power and control. And our focus today isn't any different. Our culture praises people who are the best, who is powerful and who is beautiful, who is strong and popular, who is wealthy. Sooner or later we all fall into this temptation in some way or another. We want power. We don't want to serve the helpless. No, we want people to serve us. Sadly, today's gospel wasn't the last time the disciples would argue about who was the greatest. Later, Jesus would tell them to go and prepare for the Passover feast. And when they had all arrived at the house, the disciples began discussing who was going to wash the feet. Because they had been walking outside all day in the hot sun. They wore sandals, and their feet were hot and sweaty and dirty. And it was tradition for the host of a party to have a servant who was going to wash the feet of the guests. None of the disciples wanted to do this servant's chore. Yet, when Jesus arrived, he washed their feet. He, their master, washed them as a servant would. And Jesus didn't stop there. In fact, his service was only beginning. That evening, he served the disciples, and he served you and me by allowing a band of soldiers to arrest him. He served us by enduring torture and shame. He served you by carrying your sins that you could never pay for to the cross. He served you by enduring God's holy wrath against your sin while he hung there. 
He served you by dying as the sacrifice for your sins. And he served you after his friends laid him in a tomb by rising from the dead and announcing his victory over your sin, and your death, and the power of the devil. So Jesus said the greatest in God's kingdom will be the servant of all. And so he is the greatest. Jesus Christ is the greatest because he served the entire world by offering himself up as the atonement for sins. Jesus Christ is the greatest because he serves us who are the most helpless. We are helpless children, lost in our sin and facing the certain penalty of death. We who would be great in our power and greed receive the generosity of the Savior who serves. And now that Jesus has served us with the ultimate sacrifice, he is able to work through us by his Holy Spirit so that we can serve others. God gives us the power to share his loving sacrifice with the people in our lives. So we no longer need to debate about who is the greatest. Because we know our God, our Savior Jesus Christ, is the greatest. Because he is servant. And that's certainly a change of focus. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. I invite you all to stand as we sing our next hymn, number 785.
confessing our Christian faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed, and that is printed on page 4 of the bulletin. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated as we come before the Lord with our tithes and offerings. <coughs> now pray for the church, the world, and all of God's creation. I will end each petition by saying, Lord, in your mercy, please respond with, hear our prayer. Gracious God, we pray for your church on earth. Give it the gift of discernment to know what is needed and the humility to ask what is necessary. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We give thanks for another year of harvest, for farmers, gardeners, farmers markets, and community gardens. 
Teach us to share the earth's abundance with all who hunger. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the leaders of all nations. Take away selfish ambition, conflicts, and disputes, and guide leaders to work for the good of all people. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for those afflicted, afflicted by shortened daylight hours, for those who struggle with envy, and for those who suffer from impulses that are at war within them. We pray for all those in any kind of need, especially this week, Mill Ray Gardner, Pat Gardner, Peggy Spicknell, and the family of Mary Ellen Macarood, who went home this week to be with you, Lord. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for children in this congregation and community. Give them compassion and patient families, caregivers, mentors, teachers, and friends. Assure them that Jesus is always with them and loves them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We ask your blessing on the family of Adam and Tiffany Fitzke as they celebrate the birth of their daughter, Emerson Ann. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We rejoice in the baptism of Cooper William Miller and Emerson Ann Fitzke. We ask that you bless them and their parents, guide and guard and protect them all the days of their life, that they may grow up and lead a life that honors you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Into your hands, gracious God, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen. The closing hymn is number 763. We sing together.
then serve the 